Faye Garden. Uh, I will be going there now, so if you don't know the location, you can follow me. And the females as well, someone will join you there and take you down there. Thank you. And thanks, Thank you. Mr. Gan, for the excellent presentation. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, sir. So, we will leave your bag here again. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back. Uh, now is the time for our second lecture, which is titled Saudi Arabia, E-Health and Health IT Standards. It will be presented by one of our distinguished speakers, Mr. Keith Boone. Uh, Mr. Boone is a standards expert for GE Health, uh, GE Healthcare. His present, uh, in his present work, uh, he represents GE Healthcare to several standards organizations, including Health Level 7 International. Mr. Boone, uh, Boone also uh, was the past working chair and contributing member and past board member and committee chair and in integrated uh, the integrating the healthcare enterprise. He is presently engaged in Saudi Arabia with the Ministry of Health to help establish the national health IT standards for the ministry's expensive e-health program. Uh, he also represents GE to the U.S. national program, the Standards and Interoperability Framework, framework and the participants in the development of U.S. and he is a participant in the development of U.S. national policy on health IT standards. He has edited or contributed to more than two dozen international implementation guidelines, guide, guides, and health IT standards, and is the author of the CDA book. He is presently a master candidate in the clinical informatics program at Oregon Health and Science University. Please welcome Mr. Poon to start his lecture. Shaka. Uh, salam alaikum. So you have now reached the extent of my Arabic. I am, I am you know, not a Saudi national. I'm a, a U.S. citizen from Boston. Uh, but the first time I came here and presented a workshop, somebody said I should try the, the Saudi style, so I did. And I, I find it comfortable, especially uh, in the summer months. So um, how many of you here are taking the, the AMIA I 10 by 10 class? Several in here? Okay. Um, how many people of you have, have run across the, the Motorcycle Guy blog? A couple of you. That would be me. Right, so, so on Twitter, I'm known as Motorcycle Guy, and there's a little story about how I was at an e-health conference in Connecticut, and I had ridden my motorcycle down to, to the Connecticut conference, and I showed up and presented in a, in a stage much like this. Uh, and I became known to the folks at eHealth Connecticut as Motorcycle Guy. So that's, that's how my blog got its name. Um, and if you're taking the I-10 by 10 class, you took unit one, uh, and you, Bill talks about three blogs to follow. One of them is the Motorcycle Guy blog, uh, Motorcycle Guy uh, at blogspot or dot blogspot dot com. That's my blog. So, uh, what I'm here to talk to you today about is eHealth and health IT standards in Saudi Arabia. And so, I introduce myself. See if I can figure out which button to push and what to point at. Point it towards the keyboard. What's the problem? We try to solve it in the morning. Okay, so I'm going to put the keyboard up here because trying to... But it's working, no? Just up and down. Just up and down? Yeah, up and down. All right. And the middle of the point. Okay, so uh, as mentioned, I'm currently a master's candidate uh, in uh, Dr. Hirsch's program at Oregon Health and Science. Uh, last term, I took 
the same course as the Amy at 10 by 10 uh, taught by Bill. And actually, while I was here in Saudi, we had a long Skype chat about his unit on standards. Um, I'm a standards geek at GE Healthcare. It actually says that on my card. So I work with a lot of different standards organizations in healthcare. My talk to you today is mostly about those standards and what they are. Two of the organizations I work with, one of them is Health Level 7, otherwise known as HL7, and Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise, or IHE. One of the things you're going to learn about in health IT, we like something called the TLA. Okay? TLA, three-letter acronym. So you're going to see a lot of TLAs, and you're going to see a number of FRLAs, four-letter acronyms, uh, in this. And this is a shorthand that those health IT geeks like me have sort of developed to talk about things. It's about as frightening to you as it is for me, an IT guy, to come into a medical informatics program and learn that distal means far. Okay, and then I have to come up with a whole new set of language to say things that I already know how to say in English. So you're going to run into the same thing. You've already done this once uh, in becoming medical professionals. In becoming informatics professionals, you're going to have to do it again. You're going to have to learn the language of health IT. And some of that language is around the standards. So that's what we're going to cover today. Um, I spend a lot of my time in GE promoting the use of standards. Part of the reason I'm able to teach here um, is because standards are important. But if, if GE is the only one who adopts a standard, how useful is that to us? It's not useful at all. The point about standards is they're only useful when everybody uses them and everybody understands them. So I've been involved in the development of numerous standards. Several of these are used in our U.S. national program. Some of those same standards are going to be applied to the Saudi eHealth program. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And some of the, the material that you're going to be getting from me, um, I wear many hats in my role at GE. I'm an employee of GE. I am a member of the board of HL7. I'm past member of the board and past co-chair at IHE. You're going to see three different presentations in this long presentation, maybe not too long. Uh, inshallah. Um, but we will cover some of the standards and then we'll bring it all back together. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is really a question. So what is health IT to you? And so I'm an interactive presenter. I want to hear from people while I'm talking. So what is health IT? So somebody tell me, give me an example or tell me what you think health IT is. I'm going to pick on you right now because you should know the answer. And let me get, let me grab a mic, real quick. So, what do you what do you think health IT yeah, is? Yeah, I mean IT. Is it working? Perfect. Oh. There you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, everyone knows IT. Health IT for me is everything um, in IT that we can benefit from in health and healthcare. And sometimes we call it health informatics, sometimes medical informatics, or e-health. At the end is how to create innovative and creative solution of IT to benefit health and healthcare. Okay, so that's a, that's a really, really great answer. Does anybody else have, a, have an answer to this question? All right, let's see what I said. Oops. So it's a term used to describe a collection of information systems, or IT, used to store, manage, and exchange healthcare information with other information systems and more and more medical devices, right? Medical devices, we, the first medical device, maybe a tongue depressor or a syringe, those were medical devices. Now medical devices, every medical device has a computer in it. So it's also health IT. Right? Now, if we look at health IT, what are some examples of health IT systems? People just call these out. You know these. You work with these. RIS. Okay. What else? PACS. PACS. EMR. 
EMR? LIS. LIS? Okay, so you have to stop now. Okay. Hospital information systems. Okay. So a lot of different information systems. Right? So we have HIS, which has CPOE, which has, we connects to the LIS and the PACs and the RIS. You have Health Information Exchange, EHR or EMR, or well, we also talk about PHC systems here, um, revenue cycle management. And maybe not something you have to worry about so much because 60% of your health care is coming from the ministry. There's also private sector health care. Um, and you still have to pay for it somehow. So you still have to figure out what things are costing. E-prescribing. So then we get into this term e-health. We've been talking about e-health all morning so far. But has anybody really defined it? Well, e-health, it's, it's like email, right? We had mail. It was paper. We sent paper back and forth. Now we're sending electrons back and forth uh, to deal with mail. And with health care, we've been doing what? Paper. Right? So e-health is let's move away from paper and more into dealing with electrons. So benefits of e-health. We talked about some of those this morning. What do you think some of the benefits of e-health are? Reduce cost, accuracy. Provide access, can trace information. Can Provide access to information. Safety. 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 Reduce medical errors, research. These are all great benefits. I didn't, I didn't even bother listing them because there's a gazillion benefits. This is a, a, a detailed technical term that means a lot. Okay, now, Saudi Arabia is doing quite a bit to move into the e-health space. They're investing a lot of money. There's something like 300 projects and 85 priorities. I don't know how you manage it um, to try to do all of this. There's a lot, a lot going on. Okay, there is an e-health strategy. Uh, Dr. Ham mentioned it uh, this morning. Um, I have the links to it in both English and in Arabic here, it's actually published on the MOH website. It's, it's very easy to find. How many of you here have actually read the National eHealth Strategy? Okay, so guess what? I give homework. Okay, so your homework is that you need to read the National eHealth Strategy. And there will be a test. And the test for you is how well you, as leaders in this field, are able to execute on that strategy. I'm not going to give the test. Your country, your nation, is giving you that test today. So standards is what I'm about. It's what I do. Um, so what is a standard? Well, there is, believe it or not, a standard definition for a standard. Uh, has anybody ever here Googled recursion? That's a word in computer science. So if you ever Google recursion, the first thing you're going to see at the top is, is, did you mean recursion? And if you click on it, you'll get back to the same page because you keep going down. Right? So we have a standard definition for standards. Geeks like me like recursion. We like to talk about things in terms of themselves and compositions of information. So we have a standard for a standard. So it's a document established by consensus and approved by a recognized body that provides for common and repeated use, rules, guidelines, or characteristics for activities or their results aimed at the achievement of the optimum degree in order of given context. I rarely read slides. I expect you to be able to read. Um, this is one I do read because it's important that you understand what the standard for the standard is. And that's what it is. Let's parse this. Whoops. I hit the wrong button. Now I don't know how to get back. So I'm going to come back over here and use the mouse. Ugh. So, our, the original standards were brass weights. 
They were physical objects. They were yardsticks. They were uh, lengths. Right? The, orig- the original standard for measurement was your arm from here to here. Right? Or the width of your thumb. We had physical representations. Um, now we're getting into documents, conceptual definitions. So it's no longer the physical object. Right? The definitions for mass, the definitions for distance are actually now defined in terms of physical characteristics that can be measured repeatedly no matter where you are. We have a document now that gives you the rules that can be understood no matter where you are, established by consensus among stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? You are the stakeholders in standards. Right? So internationally, when standards get developed, they are developed by the stakeholders. How many people here are participating in standards internationally? Okay, that needs to change. And some of what I'm going to talk about is what's happening to enable that to change here in the kingdom. Right? For common and repeated use. Oh, approved by a recognized body. Authoritative. Right? We talked about, we heard about JCI and all of the work that they do. And everybody understands JCI is an authoritative body. HL7 and IHE are authoritative bodies for standards. They are among many. We'll see more later. For common and repeated use. We don't want to do this. We don't want to connect this hospital to that hospital and then this hospital to that hospital and then those two hospitals. Because as soon as you start doing it that way, it takes n times m or n times n squared uh, numbers of connections that you have to develop, and every single one of them is a one-off, and it becomes a huge, insurmountable problem. Rules, guidelines, and characteristics, that is the meat, the essence of what we're trying to do to deal with processes and products um, aimed at the achievement of the optimum degree of order in a given context, aimed at the achievement. You've got to work at this. There is no guarantee. Okay? It's any process, uh, as Russ was talking about this morning, you know, you set the standards, but then you have to follow the standards if they are to work for you. To the optimum degree of order, who decides? The stakeholders. So the optimum degree of order is in their eyes. In a given context, you don't set a standard without understanding how you're going to use it. There are a number of uh, additional definitions of standards. Um, There's one by the British Standards Institution. It's one of the oldest standards organizations in the world that that they use. You'll see that it's very similar. Um, there's organizations in the United States. Uh, there's one of them called the National Institute of Standards uh, and Technology um, that resulted from the activity of the National Standards Policy Advisory Council in the United States, some of the recommendations that they made, um, and their definitions of standards. These, these materials uh, are actually borrowed from a colleague of mine, Harry Solomon, who also uh, teaches In Bill's class, he teaches a class on standards. These are slides that uh, he helped develop, and actually he and I teach at GE to our engineers, not just our healthcare folks, but our aircraft engineers and our electrical engineers and all throughout the people who build trains about standards, because it's not just about healthcare where you need standards. But he provided these slides. So the point of all of, of this use of standards is to make systems talk to each other. Russ said, you know, if you get Cerner installed at the first hospital, by the time you get to the last hospital, they weren't not going to be talking to each other because you'll have different versions. Well, that's true if your interoperability is constantly based on proprietary technology. How many people here are using the web? I should see every hand raised, right? Now, your browser is using and supports... HTML version 5. Do you know that you can actually use that same browser through the evolution of the standards and the rules that have been applied to read the first web pages, 
that were created in HTML version 0.9, and those pages are still on the web. This is the value of standards. That happened in 1995. Okay, how many of you have ever had to go back to an old WordPerfect document or an old Word document and try to read it with your current system? Does it work? No, it does not work. Okay, proprietary technology. HTML, standards-based. Okay, now, there's a definition for interoperability that shows up in the IEEE glossary. All right, does anybody here know what that definition is? I'm sure there's got to be at least one person here who knows what that definition is. Yes? No? Oh, well, eh, a little bit? A little bit. Go ahead. The ability of two systems to talk to each other and exchange information accurately with meanings. Okay, so that's actually pretty close. Oops, I did it again. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> We're going to have to do this several times. So the old definition is the ability of two or more systems or components to exchange information and to use the information that's been exchanged. So nobody here got the answer wrong. The new definition is the ability of a system or product to work with other systems or products without special effort on part of the customer. And interoperability is made possible by the implementation of standards. Now, the reason I ask this question is that definition at the bottom is the definition that was originally published in the IEEE dictionary, I think, more than 10 years ago. All right? If you take that text and you quote it and you put it into Google, you will get more than 92,000 hits for that whole sentence on an exact match search. All right? So the ability of two or more information systems to exchange information and to use that. This is what we're building the e-health system in Saudi Arabia on, is standards to support interoperability. Now, standards, there's all a bunch of different standards organizations, and there's a structure to the standards organization. So there are three International treaty organizations through the UN that everybody acknowledges. These, this is the top of the field. So you have the International Organization for Standardization, or ISO. You have International Telecommunications Union, ITU, and the IEC, International Electrotechnical Commission. Each of these standards organizations has working groups or technical committees. Um, some of them, like JTC1, is a joint technical committee between the IEC and ISO. Okay? Um, some of these have national member bodies and others just have uh, accredited bodies uh, amongst them. So if we look at some of the national member bodies, ANSI, American National Standards Institute, is in the U.S. In Saudi Arabia, who knows what the, the name of the standards organization is? SASO. Saudi Arabia Standards Organization. It's nice that they have a nice acronym that I can use and understand in English. You have the British Standards Inf Institute. Um, and many of these uh, standards organizations then have accredited standards committees underneath them that are separate organizations. So ANSI has many uh, standards organizations like HL7, X12, uh, ASTM, which used to be the American Society for Testing and Materials, and it's now just simply ASTM Inter International, because they wanted to take the American out of their name so that they could be a more international standards organization. It's like why HL7 is now HL7 International. And in sense, HL7 originally started out as a U.S. standards body. It's now an international standards body with more than 57 affiliates. So, and then in those international standards bodies, you have technical committees. So, healthcare informatics in ISO is the chief technical committee in ISO. There's a similar committee in IEC. It's called TC251. So, if you just swap the letters around, it'd be nice if they'd standardize on the names, but they haven't quite yet. You have independent SDOs, which have liaison relationships either with TC. 215, 
or with ISO directly. So integrating the healthcare enterprise and health level seven are actually uh, direct, have direct liaisons with ISO at the international level. And then some of these other independent uh, SDOs. So ITSIDU, IHT SDO, that's like an SIX SLA or something like that, a, a six letter acronym. Right. International Healthcare Terminology Standards Development Organization. Who knows what they do? SNOMED CT. Absolutely. Um, liaise with the TC215. So there, these are some of the key international standards bodies. ICT. Uh, it's, uh, I forget, uh, I can't parse that one. A communication technology. So information communication technology. That's right. That's what that acronym stands for. It basically means computers, electrons. Um, so you have standards organizations like ISO, like CEN, DICOM. DICOM's used for what? Yeah, okay. Don't read the slide. Tell me something else. What it translate that into DICOM is used PACS. PACS. Right. So HL7 is used with the HIS, the RIS, the LIS, all of the other, you know, departmental ISs. Um, IEEE for medical device communication. Um, and then ASTM has a number of standards, especially around policy, um, but you'll see later also around healthcare information at a conceptual level that needs to be exchanged. Profiling bodies. We'll talk a little bit about what profiling bodies are, but they're bodies that take bunches of standards and put them together to solve a use case. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about Saudi eHealth Exchange. So what is happening to connect the systems together in the country right now is the Ministry of Health, through several different uh, agencies and departments within the ministry, one of them being Strategy and Change Management Office, which I'm working with, is developing an e-health exchange infrastructure. This is the cloud, okay? Now, Dr. Al-Wahhabi, who is, is leading some of these efforts, um, recently received an award from IDC for his work in moving forward with the strategy, with the cloud-based strategy. So there will be uh, centralized systems that will be on the internet that will keep track of information. And you might have your Cerner Hiss, or it might be an Epic Hiss if they ever come here, or it might be a locally developed Hiss, or you might have a, a web-based portal for primary health center. And it will communicate over the internet to the centralized registry and repository of information. So let's take a peek inside that cloud. There's multiple components. There's a, a service bus, a HSB, um, that's patterned very much after what uh, Canada Health Infoway did for its uh, electronic infrastructure um, that is basically acting as the front end where a lot of these services come in and make requests to store information or access information. That information's coming from uh, lists of documents in a document repository or images, that, that image repository, that's essentially a cloud-based PAX. Right? The document registry is an index of documents. It captures the metadata about the documents, it's basically in a database so that you can go search for specific sets of documents. And then the document repository contains the full text of those documents so that you can access that and do interesting things with it. And in those documents is detailed clinical data. Information about what's happening to the patient. And that can be parsed out and put into the clinical data repository. That's connected up. We call it a client registry. It's actually connected up to the Ministry 